So, no further ado, our next speaker, or our keynote speaker for this conference is Meg Lohman. Jake do. <laughs> Thank very, you very, very much. Thanks to this guy for hosting us. Also to Michael, who's gone. Okay, so. Michael, where are you going? Thank you. The no one's gone. So I thought today I might put things in a global context and talk to the Eagle's Nest people later because maybe 10% of your proceeds could help save trees on the planet. That's right. Let's talk about that. Yes. And uh, save trees is really great. So my uh, whole life has been spent finding trees and saving trees and studying trees. So any tree questions around the world, I'm happy to answer. But I do have a question for you. Raise your hand if you were climbing trees in the 1970s professionally. Oh, my God. So probably I should say raise your hand if you were even bored by the 1970s. It's good to have a young crowd. So that just gives me a little level of understanding because I guess technically I was the first global urbanite. I've studied trees in every continent in the world, including Antarctica. Did you know that I could study the canopies of Antarctica? Because I actually studied the little things living in the moss and lichen on the tops of the little bits of rock and ice. But anyway, so I guess I can claim that. But um, technically, this is kind of a surprising little factoid. You know, we invented scuba gear in the 1950s. Anybody do scuba diving? And that opened up coral reef science for the whole world. We went to the moon in the 1960s. Anybody alive for that? Oh my God. And that, of course, NASA spent billions of dollars taking us into outer space. It wasn't until the 1980s that we technically started studying the tops of trees. And whereas astronauts are people who study outer space, I'm an arbornaut, so are you, people who study the tops of trees. So that's your new title, and you can steal it from me, but it is the name of my next book, too. Um, I want to make a little side pitch during my talk for whatever happened to all the women in this crowd. And um, I know there's some of you, and that's really great, but we probably could use more. Um, I always look at this picture of poor old Marie Curie, the only woman in the picture. She looks so cranky, but probably because she just didn't have anybody to talk to but all those crazy men with huge mustaches. But, you know, in my world, too, I've noticed over the years that I started out having only zero women on every expedition along with me, and now it's building up my over time, which is really cool. Through. And the other little message I want to convey a bit is I'm a mom. Um, you know, in my lifetime, 50% of the trees in the world have disappeared. So for some of you, that's probably quite similar. That's a pretty embarrassing statistic for those of us who love trees. It means something's not really working the way we would want it to work. So I want to address that, but I also want to give a pitch for bringing kids into our world. I do think tree houses is the most fantastic hook you can ever have. Um, this is where I grew up, like a lot of you. I grew up in a temperate zone. Um, I grew up in rural upstate New York. Uh, there weren't movie theaters in my town. There weren't computers when I was a kid, so you can see how old I am. But what is amazing to me is I don't even know how come I like science because I never had a woman science teacher. I adored Rachel Carson, but she was dead. I adored Harriet Tubman, but she was dead. She was the lady that took all the slaves through the Underground Railway and freed them in the North, which was very cool because she did it at night by feeling moss on the trees. Talk about a cool naturalist. She was awesome. Um, in my family, the only scientist I could ever find was my great-grandfather because he made whiskey in the Prohibition with the corn on our farm. <laughs> and um, Lauman, New York, where I'm from, anybody driven from New York to Cleveland on Route 17, but... There is a town called Lauman. It used to be quite a good corn and whiskey town, but um, now, unfortunately, all that's left is the big sex shop for all the truck drivers, and it serves a huge district, and I know my grandfather is rolling in his grave, but you can still drive through Lauman if you get up my way. Um, so back to the kid thing, you know, I had the, a wildflower collection when I was age about three to six, and I took it to the New York State Science Fair in elementary school, scared to death. I never 
was ever able to talk. I was so shy. And I pressed all these flowers in a thing called a telephone book. Do you remember the days when they were made out of paper? Like today, I, I tell kids I press my flowers in a telephone book, and they look at their iPhone, and they wonder, how did I get the flowers in there? Uh, anyway, um, I was the only girl in this science fair, and that's pretty scary. Most of the guys had these volcano experiments. Remember them? You put the vinegar in. And um, lo and behold, I got a second prize, this little plastic trophy that's long since been thrown out. But um, it elevated me to feel like Marie Curie for at least a day and reminds me that we do need to get girls and kids, I think, engaged in our world. And you guys are the real ambassadors for trees. I hate to say it, but scientists can't really communicate as well as maybe people who build tree houses. So I'm going to lay it on your shoulders, but I do think we have a lot to offer to kids, to girls, to the whole world as far as promoting the importance of trees. And thanks to treetop exploration and arbornauts and some of the research that's been done in the last 20 years on carbon storage and things that live up there and how much productivity trees have, we now know that without trees we will die tomorrow. So they are absolutely essential for human health. But most humans don't know that. Probably 90% of businessmen in all of the companies in corporate worlds across the US have no idea that a tree is really helpful to them or even essential to them. So that's part of, I hope, what your message needs to be when you talk to people. Uh, so how did we get this knowledge? How did we go up in these trees as scientists? I wanna kinda just take you through my journey and then talk about what we can do with these tools that we all use to save the trees, because I think together we can really do that. Um, it used to be, when you think about it, foresters 100 years ago, how did they study a tree? They walked through the forest, they looked up, sometimes they cut the tree down to see what was at the top, and they said, wow, we're pretty cool, we know everything about trees. And if you ever asked an old forester what was at the top of the tree, they'd say nothing. And you'd say, well, how do you know? They say, well, we know there's nothing because we can't see anything. So it was this incredible thing. It would be like your doctor looking at your big toe and saying, you don't need brain surgery. It's kind of really crazy to think that this forestry world was so limited to this six to 10 feet from ground level. And so I just call that reach and grab because people used to reach the leaves at the bottom of a tree and think they were the same as the top of the tree, which is, as we all know, false, false, false. And in fact, in the tropics, sometimes the leaves at the bottom are 20 times bigger than the leaves at the top. They don't even look alike. So it's a pretty crazy <coughs> world. Um, so I was this crazy graduate student that got a scholarship to Australia. I only actually went way out of my comfort zone of upstate New York. Uh, because I got this scholarship and I thought I would flunk, but I figured at least I'd see a koala bear and I'd come home again. Um, so lo and behold, I wanted to study how long a leaf lived in a tropical tree because I knew of my maple trees, they died every six months when the snow came and that was pretty simple. So um, I thought maybe I could use binoculars like most foresters and maybe I could train a monkey, but there weren't any monkeys in Australia. Um, so my advisor said, you know, you're going to really have to get up to the whole tree. And I freaked out about that. Um, and I didn't know what to do, but I met a few cavers. And there was a caving club at Sydney University. And so I borrowed this industrial sewing machine from one of the cavers that they use for their gear. Because this is 1978 when there wasn't any new tribe and there certainly wasn't any REI or places that we could order recreational climbing equipment, and so I saw this first crazy harness. Oh, ouch, it was so sore on my butt. Um, and I obviously welded a slingshot out of a piece of metal, and I borrowed a couple of ropes from the cavers. So lo and behold, that was what happened. I remember the date because it was my mother's birthday, and I told her what I did on her birthday, and she was horrified. Um, so I climbed this coachwood tree, it's called, and when I got up about 90 feet, I couldn't believe it. There, it's quiet on the forest floor in the tropics, but at the top of this tree, everything was up there. All the pollinators, all the vines, all the flowers, the fruits, the new leaves, the insects eating the new leaves, the iguanas eating the insects, and the birds eating the insects and the iguanas, and everything. It was just like this mayhem, and my gosh, I couldn't believe it. And that was kind of the beginning of this amazing 
new world of all of us becoming arbor nuts. Ironically, about six months later, a guy named Don Perry did the same thing in Costa Rica, but he was able to buy some actual gear because he lived in the US and he started teaching people to climb in Costa Rica in 1980. I started teaching people to climb in Australia, Asia, New Zealand, and that part of the world in 1979. So together we kind of feel like, oh my gosh, we can rank everyone. We're both grandparents, we figure, because there's been two generations of arbor knots since we started teaching people to climb. But it's kind of amazing that we actually could do that for about 300 bucks. In my case, I know exactly what it cost me because that was all the budget I had as a grad student. Um, and uh, maybe Don had a little more fancier gear down there in Costa Rica, but we still laugh about this origin of the arbor knots. Um, so with that, suddenly we could study the whole tree. We were not limited to ground level, and that has truly transformed what we know about trees and why we know there's carbon storage and why we know about productivity and why we know about all sorts of things that now are used as metrics by governments to try to save forests or maybe offset carbon dioxide or pollution or other kind of things. And so it's become really critical that we keep doing these studies of whole trees and that we don't ever go backwards and cut trees down to study the top or even worse, ignore that 95% of the tree entirely. And the coolest thing for me that came out of my research was finding out that half of the things on planet Earth live in the top of the tree. So you guys are going where everything lives. The rest of the 50% lives in coral reefs or fields or meadows or anything else, but we estimate half of the species are up there. And even more amazing is we know that probably less than 10% have been discovered. So chances are every time you climb a tree to make a tree house, you are amongst new species. If you want to learn something, you could classify them and name them after your girlfriend or your enemy or your friend or whatever. There's so many new things up there to discover and you are climbing amongst them every single day, which is pretty amazing to think about. And this is the rush for me as a scientist. We've got to figure out what's important for medicines or for pollinators before they go extinct because of deforestation. Okay, so I love my ropes. I climbed on my ropes for about five years. I did all sorts of cool things in Australia. And then I started getting all these volunteers that wanted to come and help find new species with me. And so I taught a lot of people to climb and I brought 20 people sometimes on an expedition and they all had to learn to climb. And I was really good at teaching them. Nobody fell, nobody had any accidents, but the place where we stayed, an ecotourist lodge in Queensland, one day the owner took me with a bottle of wine, which we drank and it was very good, mind you. Um, he said, I'm a little nervous about this whole climbing thing. What if somebody falls? It's my liability. And so on the back of a napkin after drinking all this wine and beer, like every Australian decision is made, um, we decided, wouldn't it be cool to put a trail through the treetops? And yeah, I'll talk to you later. Um, and we designed this little bridge. And this is the first canopy walkway in the world that wasn't part of like a rough expedition. We had Operation Drake in 1945 with Oxford students building this rickety bridge in Malaysia somewhere, but this was the first real operational canopy walkway in the world in Queensland, Australia. It's still standing, I'm happy to say. So that makes it what, how many years old? Uh, 35, do the Very math, I guess. Oh, Lamington National Park. I hope it's not burned. I mean, last week they had terrible fires, so I'm praying. I've called everybody and nobody's called me back. Um, so this was fantastic. <laughs> Six months later, a guy named Elar Mule. Any of you engineers? Charlie, do you know Elar Mule? Was here? I dabble. Huh? I dabble. Oh, um, but he was an engineer from Maryland that built Lambeer National Park in Malaysia. Anybody ever been there? It's like very awesome because he built with necklaces around the trees because he was building a walkway that was 125 feet tall. We built here uh, out from a, a sort of a, a little hill so we could go straight and be ADA accessible with this first walkway in Australia. And as you'll see, we use pole structure, meaning the walkway was at most about 50 feet high. And then there were ladders going up tall trees for people who wanted views and elevation. So pretty rough and primitive, but meanwhile, this pretty cool engineer from Maryland designed this 
walkway on the trees that's just a little younger than this one. So the two first walkways, surprisingly, are over in the Asian tropics and not in the, what we call the New World, which is North and South America. Um, still had a ratio problem. I was doing all this research and I was the only girl. Even worse, I had two young children and I had to take them on a lot of expeditions and pray they wouldn't be too noisy at night, wake up all my colleagues. But that's a whole other story. And I did write a book about it. I brought some books um, to talk about being a woman in science and all the challenges in general of being an arbornaut, which are kind of cool. But um, eventually I left Australia because when you have children in the outback, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I did live there 11 years, you can't work. My in-laws said, no way. Being a scientist and being a female were absolutely incompatible and they forbid me to work on my leaves and my trees. So eventually I had to take what I call intellectual asylum and leave Australia and raise my young children in America where they could grow up kind of getting a different point of view. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have done that. I was probably the happiest single mom in the world because I got to pursue my trees without guilt. Um, and so I went to Williams College as a professor and lo and behold, uh, an arborist came up to me one day and said, hey, I heard you built this walkway in Australia. Why don't we build one in Massachusetts? So the first walkway in North America, 1991, built in the temperate forests of Massachusetts for a big cost of $5,000, because we did all the labor ourselves, of course. It has a ladder access that we could pull away so drunk students wouldn't find it at night. And then we could put it back, and we had a combination lock to get it. And then we had some bars up the tree so that we could step on them, and we had two platforms, one on either side, and a bridge between. But my students made all these cool discoveries. One of them discovered a new predator on the gypsy moth. USDA had spent $5 million over an Amherst mass working on gypsy moths on the forest floor. My student went in the canopy and found a new predator on the gypsy moths for his little tiny cost in one harness, and he got a scholarship to every graduate school in the country. So it just shows you the power of going up was so great, and we didn't need a big budget to do it. Um, so this was uh, not the first public canopy walkway in North America, though you had to be a Williams College student to use it. The college put limits on that. And liability was not an issue. I did a lot of research, but for all these institutions that maybe take students on boats, there's huge liability. If you climb a mast of a ship, it's just as equally dangerous or wonderful as it is climbing up into a treetop. So there really was never any problem getting these things insured, even though people always ask me that question. A um, couple years later, we now have the biggest canopy walkway in the world going up in Peru. And this still exists. It's a quarter of a mile long. It has 13 platforms and 12 bridges. It is totally awesome. It's amazing. It took three months to build the first platform. Why? Because nobody had a generator or anything else. They hand drilled all the different pieces of the walkway. Then some guy came down from the US with a battery operated drill. The locals went crazy with joy. And they built the whole rest of the walkway in three more months. So that just shows you the importance of technology. And to this day, I still marvel at the whole thing. Um, cost about a half a million dollars in the 1990s. This is something I'm going to come back to later because this walkway now is responsible for a million acres of reserve. It is absolutely employing 170 families who realize they're making more money from ecotourism than from logging their trees, which is what everybody else in the river system is doing. So with ecotourism, we can actually help the world save forests because people need an income. They can't just put their forests under a glass dome and leave them alone. They need to feed their kids and they need to have a livelihood. So by providing ecotourism in all of these endangered forests of the world, we all could be part of a huge solution of saving species, saving carbon. And so these things have to be adjusted all the time. It's not 
the kind of thing that you and I would ever do in the temperate zones because it would cost you a fortune to maintain it. But down there where labor's free, it seems to have been working over time, even though I wouldn't use that in any other design anywhere else in the world. But this one is kind of historic and it's still doing great things. We've moved at least three platforms and probably three or four bridges because termites keep following us and that's one of the things you have to be pretty nimble about in the tropics. But the cool thing is you can work at night. Back to my issue of liability, you can take 20 people in a walkway at once, whereas on a rope you can only take one. So you have this amazing opportunity to really create fantastic ecotourism Question. in a walkway like that. Yeah. So when people say my system is best because I say it's best, can engineers help there? Sure they can. I mean, obviously all of these are engineered because you need, with those stainless steel cables and where they're being positioned, you have to have the opportunity to do that. The other interesting thing is there are choices, and maybe there's choices that are okay. Now, I like through bolts the best. That's my preferred method, having maybe built 20 or 30 walkways around the world, just because it's like putting a pierced earring through, right? All that dead wood in the center of the tree is not a problem. Some of these huge trees and some of the liability of not having the proper generators re are reason for some of these taller walkways to maybe end up with different kinds of more necklace type of systems, if that makes sense to you. But it doesn't mean they're wrong or right. You just gotta think about your maintenance and you gotta think about, is it cost? Is it human hours? What is it you're gonna do? Is it ability to move the platforms and the bridges? And with good observations and a little bit of science in this, you can always move bridges and walkways. Um, in our world of walkways now, we kind of have a sequence of how it works. And the number one is the scientist. I'm a real believer, obviously I am that scientist, but going to a site, you want to say, I want to maximize all of my visitors to see nature. I have been on so many walkways in Costa Rica where you're not even close to a leaf. It's just this metal bridge across some kind of chasm where they charge you 20 bucks to go on it. I think a walkway needs to have the highest biodiversity and the best experience of looking at a pond or a bird area or something. And then number two, we bring in the designers and the engineers to say, okay, can we build on these trees? And how are we gonna position it? And then number three, we budget it and we bring the builders back and do it. So we sequence ourselves, science first, and then engineering and design second. And once in a while, it might be in the coolest biodiverse area, you can't engineer it. But usually we can figure out a way to minimize any tree damage and maximize the experience of the visitor to really come away saying, wow, I love trees, I wanna help save nature. Um, just a little bit for Isabella this morning, Peru and all these locations are fantastic where they all use natural products for their dyes. These are ladies in the Andes. All of their clothing is made from insects and plants that they harvest themselves. And, here they are demonstrating to a group of my students about how they make all these dyes. So it's amazing to go to these countries and see on the one hand, they might not have uh, generators, but on the other hand, they have a thousand years of incredible dyes and things like that. This is for Jake. This was Jake's childhood. This is Millbrook School Milbrook. where he was a student as a young lad, I guess what age? Eight, in the he, 60s. In the 60s, oh my gosh. So years later, I came to Millbrook School and we built this canopy walkway after Jake had graduated. But he went back for his reunion, I oh, guess, and got the shock of his life. Um, this one, pretty simple. A, a access with these boards is kind of a ladder type of structure that we can actually pulley up again to keep the kids if they've had a little bit of tiddling on the Friday night. They don't drink in Milbrook, do they? <laughs> no. No, um, they can protect themselves. And then it has a simple, again, three bridges in this case and three platforms. But these students, these are high school students, actually did bird banding in the canopy and made all these discoveries about when birds are flying at night and day and all sorts of pretty cool things. Um, just, well, I just came from here. This is Vermont last weekend near Quichi, Vermont, an 800 foot uh, long walkway that's fantastic, again, all on poles. And some of you know my partner that I've been working with for 25 years, Robbie Oates, and maybe some of you have met Bart Baricious or Phil Whitman or a few of the other folks along the way, but Robbie actually was in charge of this construction. I was in charge of the ideas and the 
placement, but this just opened last Saturday, and hopefully and probably it's going to triple the visitorship to this tired little area in Vermont that doesn't have a lot of economy. And the coolest thing is they have a spider web about 30 feet high as part of the walkway, and it's very safe for kids to jump on and even adults to jump on. And of course, now we're going to interpret the whole world of spiders, and that'll be a fabulous way to teach a lesson about our little eight-legged friends along the way when people visit these walkways. So there's amazing walkway stories and walkways all over the world now, but we still need some more in some critical forests, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, to round out the toolkit for arbor nuts, those people who study the canopy like me, we have the ropes and harnesses, which are simple but solo, and we have the walkways, which are now nice for groups and for ecotourism. This is my favorite, admittedly, but it's not cheap. It's the French invented inflatables called Radeau de Seam, and this is the hot air balloon that fuels it. This is a little <coughs> sled that we can use to slide across all the tops of the trees, the uppermost branches that we can never get to with ropes because obviously we have to have our rope over a strong enough branch. And then here's this cool like base camp that we can live on and work from. And as you see, it's got a mesh here and I'm barefoot because you just tiptoe around on the um, pieces of inflatable, but again, fantastic. Uh, access to everything here. You can barely see me. I've come up a rope. This is in Cameroon, Africa, about 185 feet to come up here and stay a couple nights. Um, in the case of my work, looking at insects eating plants, a lot of them prefer to be active at night, so we can come up here at night. We can make a little tented section in this um, mesh and we can go to sleep or we can stick our hands through these cute little Velcro donut-like things to grab leaf samples and stuff like that, or we can dangle over the edge of this thing if we want to sample a certain height. Yeah. It's sitting on top of the canopy? It's sitting on top of the canopy, yeah. and what happens is the, the hot air balloon carries it and sets it down. Section. That's one section, right, that we've just taken because we want to surf the canopy sometimes. But we alight it on the canopy <laughs> for about four days, not any longer. It's very lightweight, so it doesn't break branches, but we just don't like to have it be there because it does shade the tree a little tiny bit in its presence. So we shift this thing about every four days by towing it with a hot air balloon. And it's, it's very cool. There's a film, an old Nat Geo film called Heroes of the High Frontier yeah. that shares my research in a really cool movie, I have to say. It was filmed in French Guiana. Heroes of the High Frontier. Um, and it walks us through different ways of exploring the county, which is kind of fun. Um, and then the fourth, oh, and this expedition again, 1994, I did my first hot air balloon expedition. I signed up as M. Lauman. Why do you think I did that? And I got in, and I arrived at 2 a.m., and all the French, I don't know too many French expletives, but I know enough of them, they were so angry because I was the only girl that got on the expedition because they thought I was Mark or Michael or something, but it was very funny. And of course, now I know the snoring habits of all of my Arbor Knot colleagues because we had 50 hammocks lined up in a shed, and they gave me the end hammock because right under it was the Gabon Viper's Hole, which is a deadly poisonous snake, and there's no known anti venom. And I think they were trying to test me will she survive? But I did. I lived through it, and to this day, of course, all those 49 men are very close colleagues around the world. And we always have a ball when we get together. Um, so fourth, the last tool in the toolkit for Arbor Nuts is the wow. construction crane. Um, this one's the most expensive. To put this in place in a tropical forest is pretty difficult. Um, first of all, you have to get one donated. I always laugh, I say, you know, when construction companies get their cranes old and rusty, they give them to biologists, because we don't care if they're rusty and probably not very safe. But these are very cool things. You can be in the bucket. Obviously, you can get to any leaf or insect within the crane arm, but remember, you can't get any further. So there is a limitation. It's a very intensive type of work on certain kinds of things. It's sure not much good for scarlet macaws because they just fly three miles away, but it's really great if you're trying to study insects on leaves or something like that. So these four things are really what's propelled this whole world of 
the Arbor Knot for these last, gosh, since 1979, so that means we're about 40 years old, is a community of canopy biologists. So all along, um, for me personally, it was a journey of trying to decide, you know, do I leave my kids at the bottom of the tree with the poisonous snake, or do I let them climb with mom? And I guess you know what the answer is for that. So they got their own little handmade harnesses at about the age of four. And I have to say, taking kids climbing is so great because they find everything quicker than we do. Their eyes are so much better than ours. And so they were my great investors research assistants. This one book in the middle called It's a Jungle Up There is co-authored with my children because as a scientist, you should co-author with your research associates. And these are my two best research associates. And they weren't much good at this age, but at least they slept a lot when they were in the harness. So I have to thank them for that. Um, okay, so there we have this little idea of where the world of canopy science is gone and where we are at now. So this is the problem. We now have probably millions of dollars that's been spent on forest conservation projects around the world, and yet we're still losing it all. And I'm sure that most people go into tree work because they love trees, and probably all of you feel the same. And yet, as I told you, we've lost over 50% of our forests. So something's not right about this. If we were all a corporation, we would have been fired years ago because we haven't achieved the goal. So as nonprofits or as scientists or lovers of trees, you know, we hear about logging or we hear about fires and we just move on to the next location, but we're running out of places to go. And some of you might be aware that the Amazon and Australia and Indonesia all burned in the last month, significant amounts of burning. So this is a pretty serious place that we're at to figure out ways to support our trees. Um, one thing for me as a scientist is I've got to start getting my act together. I've published, oh, 150 technical publications, which is what we get paid to do, which is so crazy. I've actually quit my job so that I don't have to do that anymore because I think we need to be talking to politicians and religious leaders and a whole bunch of other people outside of the world of academia. And so now I'm on another journey to try to work with different people who are the stewards of these forests. And I think I want to show you a couple case studies about how all of us can maybe engage more people in information about forests as well as a better love for saving forests. Um, so number one, this walkway, which I you now know was invented to actually help people who were helping researchers like me study in the canopy, and now all of a sudden, walkways I find are this enormous opportunity to really save forests. And um, that, oh, by the way, that's the first public canopy walkway in North America, which I built with Robbie and the gang in the year 2000. So it's now 20 years old, doing strong. It's outside of Sarasota, Florida, if anybody gets there. It tripled the visitorship to the state park, so a huge economic driver for the region as well. But in general, these walkways can really, really help save forests. And here's a great example, um, the island of Savai in Western Samoa. Anybody ever been to that site? I didn't expect you might have, but just thought I'd ask to be polite. <laughs> um, in this case, um, a couple of us got asked to come there. This is an ethnobotanist friend called, named Paul Cox. And he had discovered some really important medicinal plants in these Western Samoan islands. And he also found out that the government was requiring every island to build a school, 50,000 bucks to build a cement school. And most of them had thatched palm school, schools that were free. So all of a sudden, here's an island called Savai, no cash economy. They catch their fish in the ocean. They get their coconuts from the trees. Their spiritual heritage was all tied up in the trees. And yet they're being asked to log their forest for $50,000 to build a school. And they love their kids. They want their kids to have a great school. So Paul and I and some newspaper reporter went over there because we wanted to propose this idea that we could borrow the money, build them a canopy walkway. They could charge for ecotourism and they wouldn't have to log their trees. And so anybody ever had kava? Woohoo! Better than mushrooms. <laughs> um, drink a little bit, numbs your inside, drink a little more, and you are like, woo! 
Um, so at the end of about seven hours of drinking kava, all the 15 chiefs agreed they would take this risk for this thing called ecotourism that they'd never heard of and let these crazy Westerners build this canopy thing. And they, every once in a while, they're speaking in Samoan, they'd say, monkey woman in English, because that's my, that was what they called me. And they didn't know how to translate that to Samoan. So every time we heard them say monkey woman, we knew they were on target. We would, topic of the day. But anyway, it was quite a day, and we all had to sit cross-legged. I don't know how you guys are, but my two builders that came with me, they were hulking guys about six feet five, and they weighed 200 pounds, and they couldn't even stand up. You know, sitting seven hours cross-legged does any American person in, except for little people like me. So I was, that was one of my victory days that I could stand up at the end of the ceremony for many reasons. Maybe there were other reasons why they couldn't stand up. <laughs> um, in any case, after a lot of fussing, and there's a lot of stories here because we tried to ship poles from New Zealand and no ship would allow us to have insurance to ship poles. They said, if they all arrive broken, it's your fault. We tried everything under this design to design the right thing but in the end it was a very simple solution some of you might know kevin hillary and his wife at the time and they just said hey we'll just fly over and build it and we'll figure it out and that was great because some of the other builders got busy but we had the design and they hooked it up to the school so the tours the ecotourism tours were always led by a fifth or sixth grader and in two years time we raised the $50,000 by charging every tourist that went there, and now they have a scholarship for their kids to go to high school and college, which are off the island. So it was a real eye-opener for everybody in our world thinking, wow, you know, this thing really saved that whole island. If you log an island, you never get it back. You can never recover the seeds. They are the most endangered force of the world because it's impossible to reproduce them again. And so if they had logged that island, they would all be extinct as people as well. Um, their thank you to me and Paul and the builders was to allow us to witness the tattoo ceremonies. Tattoos were originated in Western Samoa. The first tattoos were made from the juice of the Alurites tree, which is a really cool blue fruit. And they tap it in with piranha teeth or the equivalent. And, so this is a full body tattoo, um, and they allowed us to be in the tattoo hut during the ceremony, which is really, really painful. And so I asked one of the um, women, I said, like, what's the deal? Because half the men have it and half the men don't. And she said to me, well, we think childbirth is the most painful experience in the world, but getting a full body tattoo is the second most painful experience. So we believe Men with tattoos make better husbands. So, <laughs> Tim Kovar loves that one. <laughs> so does Amy. Um, so keep it in mind, if you have a tattoo, you should feel very happy. Um, so what's happening now, um, we're trying to put these walkways in places that are really important. Uh, someone mentioned the Sequoia Zoo. I flew up there four years ago, so blame me, and talked to the zoo people. And then I flew back and gave the fundraiser talk where they raised the original money to design that walkway. And then I got Robbie Yotes to go there and look at it. And now it looks like some of you have taken over. Thank you, Scott, and a few others. But the good news is there will be a walkway in the Redwoods. There has to be because, again, it's a world treasure of a forest. Um, these are the Redwoods that belong to the... Urox. Is Casey here? Yay, Casey. Um, and I was very lucky to be invited by the Urox to go up and meet with them. So this is the tribal chiefs, and they took me out in their beautiful speedboat um, to look at some of their spiritual trees upriver. And right now, they're patiently and strategically trying to get a hold of some special areas of an experimental forest so they can build a very cool walkway and give back to their children because they think that's a really important thing to do. So I'm sure we'll get at least two, maybe more walkways. The Save the Redwood League is trying to do something on their property as well. So it's a really exciting time for this important forest piece. So there are others, and I'm gonna give you a handout at the end with the 10 forests of the world that we need to save. Uh, but anyway, just in a minute. Um, number two, we can build walkways and we can save forests. We can also get students involved in our work, and I'm sure a lot of you already do that. You give school talks, 
or you invite kids to your tree houses or your walkways or do whatever. And for me, that's become a really, like a religious experience almost. In my case, I was pretty lucky that I got involved with one of the first distance learning or virtual expedition programs um, in the world. And it was a pretty cool guy named Bob Ballard after he discovered the Titanic. He had about 16,000 kids say, Dear Dr. Ballard, can I come with you in the Alvin submarine next year? And the Alvin submarine only holds two people. So Bob said, wow, I got to do something. So he started with Nat Geo, this virtual distance learning program called the Jason Project. And he wanted to also do something on land. And he thought forest canopies were maybe the coolest thing going. So he asked me to be his partner. So we would do a marine thing, and then we would do a canopy thing. And the fun thing was, this was in the 90s. It cost about five million bucks to get all the wires and to get all the satellites on barges down to Panama or the Amazon or wherever we were broadcasting. But the cool thing is we reached millions and millions of kids. I still hear from kids saying, oh, I saw you when I was in middle school. You saw me? I saw you. Oh my gosh. I remember and you're a tree person. That makes me happy. I so and it, yeah, it was just <coughs> you <laughs> and so Yay! Um, and so today, guess what? I just got a grant. Last year, we took the Jason Project to Malaysia for $50,000, not $5 million because we just took a computer, a sound man, an, um, a host, and we could live stream all over the world. The technology is so much easier. So I beg of you, if you're building a walkway or you're building a treehouse, put it on. Well, you've already done this on TV, but you could live stream to students about trees and excitement in the case of the jason project we also took some middle school kids with us which is really cool this was one of my students who is now the world expert in sloths and monkeys sleep because he can actually not only go in the canopy but he can catch them and he puts these little hats on them and studies you know some kind of <laughs> you know what he found out which is cool every you ever heard the sloth you think oh it's a slow thing right well, he found out it's not the case at all. They used to study sloths in the lab, and they put them in a little cage, and they slept 16 hours a day. You know, what would you do if you were in a cage? You'd sleep, probably. So when he studied the sloths in the wild, they only sleep six or seven hours a day. They are not sloth-like at all. So that's the good news about sloths. We can talk about that later, too. Um, here's my student, Wendy. Some of you know Wendy Baxter. So she was one of my postdocs, and one of her favorite cool trees just down the road. So amazing things that students do if we give them the inspiration to study and save our trees. Here's her partner, Anthony Ambrose, at the top of that tree, which is 330 feet high. And he discovered that these redwoods shed like 2,000 liters of water today, every day. So you want to know about climate? You save a couple of these trees, and you will have your local rainfall and everything provided for you. Uh, here are my favorite students. These third graders on that canopy walkway in Florida discovered a new species of weevil. How? By looking out the walkway and seeing it eating all the vermilion. So they're published. They are scientifically published. No PhD required. If you go on the canopy and see something and write it up, you too can be a bona fide science without any of that pile higher and deeper stuff. Um, here are some of my other favorite students. I had, there's a guy named John Galbraith in Japan. Some of you might have worked with him because I talked to you earlier. Um, but I had a five-year summer program for kids that were mobility limited because everybody always says, you can't come outside because you're not capable. And it's a really horrible thing. If you wanted to be a field biologist, but you're in a wheelchair, what are you going to do? So. Um, we taught them to climb trees. They were fantastic. They identified and found over eight new species in oak trees in Kansas. Think what they could do in the Amazon. Here's one of their new species. All right, class. What is it? Raise your hand if you know what it is. Yay! Who said that? <laughs> I'll have to give you a prize later. But this is a water bearer tardigrade. I can promise Michael it is the commonest thing in this property. They are everywhere. They are raining on you now. They are probably on your tongue and you're swallowing them. But they're microscopic. There's about 20 fit on your little fingernail. And they love moist places. They love bark, moss, 
leaf surfaces. They even live in the Antarctic ice. They live in the bottom of hot springs. They are the ones that went to outer space. They're the ones the India space crash let go. They're on the moon now, and we assume they're having a great time. <laughs> and I promise you, there's probably a thousand new species of water bears on this property. So get going, because you can name it after all your favorite people. But the cool thing is students can do this kind of stuff, and they love to do this kind of stuff. Um, OK, number three, we have walkways saving forests. We have students growing up to save forests. Um, for me, and maybe hopefully for a lot of you, I want to get more women engaged, and especially in places like Peru and India and Ethiopia where I work. You know, here are the people, the women, the housewives in rural India. This is what they do all day. They go fishing, and they raise their garden uh, vegetables, and they have just a pretty tough life. And so my feeling is, as a scientist, if I, every trip I take to one of these countries, if I do one activity, that helps women empower themselves, I can help them become better stewards of their forest. And Sophie was with me, and so both of you guys knew Tribe came, but we did have a conference in India. Tim Kofar came too, and we, this is me in Assam teaching a bunch of women to climb trees, but here is the new Tribe gear, and Tim giving a lesson to some other students in India at a place called Hadi Valley, where we, again, did a workshop trying to empower these people that had never even seen a harness before uh, we got there. And again, we can give them so much by just so little of our own time. Here's one of my coolest students. Raise your hand. There's oh, no, me, it's my friend. What? Oh, I got the wrong <laughs> Here's Sky's friend. <laughs> She is the most fearless climber. Please raise your hand. Clap for her. She just got her PhD. She is an expert on duck fur and all the things that eat it and bite it and kill it. So if you want to learn about the health of your local trees, at the top, talk to this guy. Um, and here's my little girls in my hometown, which is very economically depressed, as you know. I don't know how the sex shop is doing, but most of the school have too many resources. So I, every summer I go home and do the Meg Lama treetops camp. We're in our 11th year. And you know, when you have girls that live in a trailer and they can't imagine they're ever gonna amount to anything, but then they learn to climb a tree, there's nothing better. It's really important. Last but not least, and I will finish, I promise, um, we gotta get different people involved. And so for me, one of the weirdest ones is religion and science, because everyone says that's not possible. But in Ethiopia, I found out that's the secret to success of saving trees. And here's shopping. Here's going to Walmart on Saturday in Ethiopia. You know, you walk 50 miles to the market. You don't have shoes, and you don't have shade, and you don't have water, but you do it anyway. And of course, look what's happened. Subsistence agriculture has cleared all of your shade. So here is the remaining forest in Ethiopia. See those things, those green dots? That is less than 5% of their forest left. That's scary. Now, you know we cleared 97% here, but we could afford to grow it back. They cleared 95%, but they have a penny of any income in their government or their local communities to replant or do the right thing. But we have to be the stewards of the world's forest. We can't just look after our little tiny patch here. We've got to think bigger because our kids need us to do this. And it's their forests have just as many medicines and unique plants and animals than ours. And so they're worthy of saving. Here's an up close view of one of those little dots. The cattle and sheep, not surprisingly, are coming in to eat all the seedlings. People are cutting the edge trees down for firewood because it's so easy and tempting. And the priest lives in the middle in this little church. And there's no computers. The schools don't have maps. They don't even have electricity. They don't know in the next valley there's no forest. They just think, oh, there's forests all around me if you're a priest. And if you're a kid, you're like, oh, there's a forest right near my school but they have no sense of that Google Earth image I just showed you. So we have those technologies and we can help them. And this was a really crazy thing, but I got a National Geographic grant to go over there and I persuaded 20 of my science friends to come over so we could find all the new species in the forest of Ethiopia before they disappeared. And we did that. We had a ball and we got a whole lot of things done. And 
Here's, this is really embarrassing, but that mite was named after me. It's the ugliest thing you've ever seen. But it's called the Lauman mite, isn't it? Precious. Um, anyway, all of this crazy scientific publication stuff isn't saving their trees. And so I started doing workshops. Every time I go there, 150 priests at a time, telling them the value of a tree. They never knew that. They never knew about oxygen or carbon or biodiversity because they never even had a textbook in their school. So they're amazed. They suddenly realize they're sitting on gold. And they said, wow, we've got to save these. And at their own idea, they persuaded the local farmers to pull the stones out of the field and make these walls around their church forest so they could save their own gold, which is called trees and biodiversity. And in these places are all of their paints and all of their business to do murals. I mean, talk about having an amazing sort of experience about how to use the plants for your livelihood. These guys are experts because they can't buy paints and they can't even buy books at this point in time. So these are murals all made from all those plants. It's pretty mind boggling how clever they are to use their trees carefully. Um, so now we have these conservation walls going up, but every time they build one, we have to fund the fences. They need, I mean, the gates. They need gates that cost, you know, maybe $1,000 to put gates around them so people can come and go to church. And my biggest challenge that I'm going to leave you with is how do we educate the next generation of priests? If you go to school and you have no books and no pencils and no paper, what good is it going to do for me to take some CD over that says Animal Planet or, you know, curriculum for nature or something like that? But these kids love learning about their bugs in this case or whatever is happening. So I have two project ideas, but they're not really ramped up as big as they should be. One is most of the kids, as you'll see, have never owned a T-shirt. They go to school in the blanket that they sleep in because how are they going to be able to afford a T-shirt since... Their families are so poor. So getting a t-shirt is the next thing to God. And so we have made these bug t-shirts, which is like a field guide on their back, in their own language. So they can, A, be very cool having a shirt, but B, have the names of the biodiversity with them. Except for me, hauling a thousand shirts over there costs a fortune. So I'm still trying to work out the bugs, no pun intended, of this project. Um, but the better project that we've come up with is that I wrote a children's book about the value of trees and then published it in their own language. And I hope to do this for Malaysian kids and Indian kids and others in the future. But if you buy one of these for $20, it pays for one to be distributed free to a kid in Ethiopia. Christmas shopping, anybody? So they're on Amazon.com. I've got about five here. But again, they can't buy books. But when they get given a book, and I give these books out all over the country in the schools next to the church forest, I, I cry. You can't imagine how exciting it is to give a 16-year-old kid their first book of a lifetime. It makes you realize how rich we are. We are so, so rich, and we have so much. And how do we equalize it just a little bit? And if we can help some of these countries save their forests, I think we'll be very happy campers. So, can we engage our world in saving forests? Can we come up with ways that our teams can do this? And I think the answer is yes. And I have this idea. I'm presenting it to National Geographic pretty soon. You know, Sylvia Earle has her mission blue undersea, and I want to propose my mission green to National Geographic because they fund Sylvia. But we have now, all these walkways in red are built, but we're proposing that we need to fill in the gaps for these forests that have so much biodiversity and value culturally and biologically that we need to build these walkways soon, within the next 10 years, really within the next five years. So I have a $10 million project. I have about $5 million, mainly because a millionaire in Malaysia already funded one walkway to be built, and another dot-com guy in Mozambique has paid for a walkway to get built, which we need to go over and build, hint, hint. And so, so we have a lot of Head Start. The walkway in Peru is already built, but it needs interpretation, which is very cheap compared to the building. So my hope is, and uh, this slide's a little it's confusing, but that we can use these walkways as a centerpiece, again, of hiring people, educating tourists, 
and saving all these cultural things, creating boat driver jobs, fishermen jobs, women cooking jobs, biodiversity naturalist jobs, medicinal shaman jobs, and all of the other stuff associated with these cultures. And we can do that because we have the talent. I think some people will fund the walkways, but I too want to make a list. I'm going to maybe put Jake in charge of it, but I would love to have the names or references from any of you who would ever consider if I called you up and said, can you come to Mozambique next March, or can you come to Peru in two years time? Yes! And, uh, and then we need to train the kids because I want to empower the girls and the families. Okay, you come twice. Oh good, two hands, thank you. And so, Oh good, I, I'm hearing you, I think you're praying too, boreal that's good. Boreal forest, you see too many dots in boreal forest. Oh yeah, we need the boreal forest, boreal forest and we need Siberia, absolutely, those huge forests, yep. for sure. And we need the Great Smokies, if anyone has a connection there. I, thank you, so we'll work on that. But um, I'm finishing a book, it should be out next year, so please, I love to collect stories from all of you, but promise you'll buy my book. I had to make a pitch because that's probably going to be funding my living by that point in time. Bye. But I do want to end with one little quote because I am a mom, and you know how moms are. They have to give advice to their wonderful sons. I have two boys, so I'm very blessed. And there's all see boys in this audience. Oh, so here's what I've learned from this journey about saving trees and studying trees. One of the most meaningful insights that I have acquired along my life journey is that it takes the same amount of energy to complain as it does to explain, but the results are incredibly different. Learning to explain instead of to complain is my most valuable lesson. Thank you very much. Q and A, yeah, you have time. And, and we have, if, if the books are just first come, first serve, and you can always order based on Amazon, but I do have a couple here for twenty bucks, and that book is twenty bucks. There's only one textbook. It costs a hundred, but I'll sell it for fifty because I don't want to carry it home. But, <laughs> uh, and if you are interested in being on this list, which is like a five-year plan, I'd love you to tell me or Jake. And I'm going to create a website. sign up list. Yeah. So be, I'll, I'll okay. Print one out. Did and you I'll know that Don Perry gave a speech on this stage? Sorry, yeah. I know he did. That's yeah. so funny. So and here's a so handout amazing. about the plan. You're so lucky. It's like Maybe amazing. we. <laughs> it's amazing. Now we thought he was first. Oh, we're now you're here. You, you know what? Up to... oh, I, I told him. He, you know, and I've told him this, and he proceeds to always say, "Oh, did you tell me that?" <laughs> <laughs>